Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. We dissect issues irrespective of our languages and of course along different perspectives. Welcome to The Advocates on Plus TV Africa. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. In other words, we tell it like it is. I'll be discussing our popular national phrases that we often laugh away and also speak to our youths. And I'm saying you're not too young to run. On the other hand, Bolaho is seriously appalled by our traumatic educational infrastructure in Nigeria. Well, Sayidu sheds lights on our country's forex ban and food importation. He's asking, are we gradually gravitating towards recession? We'll find out. In another light, Evans questions our religious doctrines as a nation. Are we fighting God or owning him? Mm. That's quite interesting. Bring it on, Evans. And our main man, Libras, gives a breakdown of our unity pattern in Nigeria. He's saying, injustice or unity, which is it? And when all is said and done, we all stand behind a single vision of a freer, fairer, and better society. Allow me to lead the way right up to the break. To restore accountability is essential to the economic and fiscal health of our nation. And so I speak on off national coinages and popular phrases. Today, I attempt a chronicle of the coinages and popular phrases from the drama we experience in governance at the national level. We are a nation of slangs and coinages. In the 80s, the iconic Andrew came with, man, I'm checking out. Andrew not check out again, oh. Nigeria will survive. Then Omario Gay yelled in our song, but Nigerians continued to check out. The unforgettable fighter of fake drugs in Nigeria, the Amazon Dr. Dora Kweli, preferred Nigeria to Niger, favored by younger Nigerians. Do you remember? And we still mouth not too young to run, but we haven't specified the percentage of youths we need in governance for continuity. Let's not go to the phenomenon that Hush Puppy was before another country did what we couldn't do. He has now become a metaphor, just like Shina Rambo and Anini. Do you remember? Lazy Nigerian youths, are you there? Nigeria is never short of fanciful, catchy phrases for developmental issues, which sadly haven't moved us forward. I'll start with prepare to be counted. That was a 1973 census campaign under General Gowan how we loved Green Revolution and Operation Feed the Nation. There was the dramatic anti-corruption X squad of the 70s, long before EFCC and the people-oriented Amotekun. Mamsa morphed into national orientation and then lost the steam, just as Ompadek morphed to NDDC, yet the looting continued. In politics, there was the violent Operation Wete, the protests that led to the first military coup in 1966 and the campaign mantra recently, Otoge in Kwara State. And what about acronyms? Never in short supply. There was Y in the 80s before Kai in Lagos. And some of us still shudder at the memories of SAP. And what about OPC, LASMA, and Festac 77 was such a jamboree. Our first ladies have had their moments too. Miriam Babingida is so unforgettable with a better life for rural women from where many women did better life. Miriam Abacha with Family Support Program FSP and then the entertaining patients Jonathan, she gifted us with. Now only you are home. Chai, there is God. -o. And before you say, it's okay, it's okay, off the mic, 
let me say that our scriptwriters for the nation must know that while we laugh and are entertained at the center, we must cut through the slangs and coinages. We'll be 60 on October 1st, and I work will be coining more phrases and slangs moving forward, or won't we? But for how long are we going to be laughing away accountability and our collective well-being? We can do better. Bola, <clears throat> hmm. uh, you're doing hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it speaks to how a lot of times we we embrace the drama of very serious issues of state. And in the process of uh, embracing the drama, um, we tend to forget the substance. And that happens all the time. Uh, whether you're talking of uh, snake eating money or of the mic, honorable minister of the mic and all the rest. Um, if we're not careful, even the of the mic might be off the table, and we won't remember because there are just so many things going on at the same time. I hope that um, as we turn 60, uh, maybe that's a little bit of that will change in, in how we can enjoy the drama, if, if, if that is enjoyment, but at the same time, not lose focus of what matters in those dramas. Yeah, Evans, um, you are you losing focus or <laughs> you're, you're on focus? Well, I, I don't think I'm losing focus. Um, it is inevitable that we have these coinages and um, society exists for the purposes of sociological development. And then um, the coinages are meant to serve a certain purposes. So that means uh, you are disagreeing with... Uh... Yes, I'm disagreeing with him to the extent that there are many sides to an issue. There is the lighter side. The entertainment There's part of it. There's an entertainment part mm -hmm. from where the comedians will source their resources. And then there is a serious side of it. There is the activist side of it and so many things. So I do not think we are losing substance, but I think that we are praising issues according to our level of understanding. No, but and, I, I, I want to disagree because um, I think um, the point is, yes, why we agree that there are all of these sides, but you find out that in most times, the comical side takes the top burner, yeah. while the real issue you know, is completely neglected until another one comes. Precisely the One point. would have expected that um, the... Off the mic. The off the mic will, be, will provoke us enough to say, you know what, this is something that is about to go down. And we can't just let them put off the mic on this issue and then everybody goes to sleep. But rather, we took the off the mic and left the issue of the money that was stolen. And, and that, I, I don't know if um, Seydou agrees with me. Yeah, yeah, well, um, I, I'm looking at it, I would like to look at it from another angle. You know, they say uh, politicians tell, uh, politicians are, they tell their citizens what they want to hear, right? So we have situations where the expectations from them, uh, you said uh, Mariam Babangida had the uh, yeah, better rural, life, better rural life for uh, rural, rural, rural women. women. And immediately after that, rather than continuing the good work that she has started, support program. Mariam Abacha came with uh, family support. Family program, support. Yeah. So there's this this thing that we need, we need to Lack create our own no continuity right. because we don't have a collective goal. You know, we talk about 2022, 20, we've been having 20, 20, 20 <laughs> years. 10, plans, 2020, but there's and no, now 2030. So we just, we just shock all of these deficiencies with coinages like you mentioned, you know, without really looking at the content. There's no continuity. Everybody wants to have something that you'll give to their, their base, if you like, you right. know, that this is what we have done. And they would coin some kind of whatever it is, you know, that works for them. So it's all politics, really. And yeah. again, you know, I always say that these are the people that we have chosen. You know, we need to we, we begin to sieve for people that will actually deliver. You know, people that will continue good projects that have been started. For instance, we're having road project. There's a transport thing going on now. Can we? Can another government come and build on the successes? And In move other on words, and have we the plan? people must begin to ask for continuity. Absolutely. If this person did it right. There's no point for somebody else to discontinue that and start his own. Absolutely. That will be discontinued again. Absolutely. 
And so we have all of these Operation Feed the Nation and then Green Revolution. No, I think, yeah, Green Ve uh, Operation Feed the Nation was for Green Revolution. And then, and then here we are today with agriculture. And we are yet to feed the nation. We are yet to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Nigeria and its phrases. It's a pity. After the break, Bolahon talks on our educational infrastructure. Let us not forget that education is the most powerful weapon with which we can change the world. And I speak of our education, infrastructure, teachers, and curriculum. In a video that went viral about a year ago, a retiree in some extreme part of Lagos constructed a makeshift bridge to connect the community with the next. He told the bridge but allowed only students to pass free. It was not the makeshift bridge that caught my attention, but the fact that it okay. was in Lagos. To me, they'll shift it to you when your time And passed. maybe students from that community might have been denied education, but for that bridge. If it could happen in Lagos, where else is secret? We have seen videos of young pupils attending classes under extreme situations leaking roofs, or sometimes no roof, and under trees with stones as chairs and their laps as the desk. I used to think that the low literacy levels in the north was all about children and parents not being interested in education until I was corrected that in some instances, there were actually no schools to go to. And because of the large landmass in that part of town, the issue of trekking to the next community to attend school is off the table. So we have problems of no schools, poor physical infrastructure, infrastructure, no furniture, no teaching aids. Do you know there are graduates in Nigeria who have never used a computer? The closest they ever got was their phone. But the education infrastructure is just one problem. How about the teachers? Our education space is populated by a whole lot of teachers who could not pass primary four standard examinations. Some who could not speak correct English language, but are teaching students in English. It is such a sad situation that some unions threaten the governor who dare to fire these incompetent teachers. That was how low we have sunk at some people. What is the standard qualification for teaching at the various levels of education in Nigeria? Who enforces the standard? The last of the education tripod I'm discussing today is a curriculum. So even if we have the infrastructure and the teachers, what are, they, what are we teaching these students? How Mongo Park discovered the Niger? Has our curriculum transformed radically from the industrial age framework handed over by the colonial masters? Is our education in sync with our national orientation and the development vision for the country? Is our education system churning out human resources of the quantity and quality that will support growth and employment? Or are we just producing irrespective of relevance to the society? I would like to leave us with a few questions on this subject matter. Are we still stuck on the industrial age orientation that says if you do not pass English and math, you are done. Since we know that technology is driving to this world and into the future, have we repositioned our education system to align with this reality? Are there students today that our existing system has left behind? Last I checked, South Africa's central government's budget provision for education alone was bigger than Nigeria's entire budget for the year. There is a strong message in that comparison. If we're going to compete in the world ahead, we must reorder our priority and let education take its prime position. Yeah, um, I, I, I often say that education is the best legacy any parents or any nation can bequeath to its um, youth. But unfortunately, when you have uh, people who are uneducated, you know, leading the others, education will become a priority to them. 
And that was how, you know, the military came on board and um, education wasn't a big deal to them and they believe you. Is it not, and now we continue to create that excuse, is it not just administration? Anybody can do it anyway. You don't need a medical doctor to be a minister of works after all is admin. You don't need a lawyer to be attorney general after all is admin. You know, but you forget that there are some basic nitty gritty, some basic terms that will be used in the course of meetings and discussion. That the, the leader has understand. to be, yeah. So you don't bring a minister to learn on the job. Before he finished learning, he probably would have been transferred and you bring another one. So it's quite unfortunate and that's why you create, you have them, um, you know, professors of education, but you bring a lawyer to head the Minister of Education. And you know, Lib, where I want to come in is this idea of a Diamond Jubilee celebration. I understand in some quarters, uh, they're saying that we're going to celebrate for a year. And I'm looking at the huge amount of money that's going to go into a one year celebration. With my um, sanitary pad projects, I went back again and re and you know, looked at what I was offering again. And I realized that we could give sanitary pads. But what about toilets? If these girls don't have that space to change, they're not still going to come to school. What about if you gave them toilets and they have no water in school, boreholes? A lot of schools don't have toilets and water. They're still not going to come to school. So I had to put boreholes and you know, provision of toilets also, in addition to the sanitary pad. And I'm just a citizen. Our government, you know, they're owing us these things for our children. Children can't in the 21st century be coming to school to read on their laps, to write on their laps. In modern day Nigeria, it is wrong. It is not fair on those children. We cannot say Nigeria of the 60s is better than Nigeria of the millennium. It is so not fair. We need this reform in education. Absolutely, I, I agree with you. And I, I'd want to tie to, you know, um, when you don't have clear vision of what uh, you want to achieve, um, if you understand the implication of having a skilled uh, manpower. manpower and how it translates to productivity, then you pay emphasis on educating people. Now, what we call education is beyond brick wall brick and mortar and putting teachers. Oh, you, need to have, you need to have clear, what, do you, what problem are you trying to solve? <laughs> we have peculiar problems. For instance, we have, for, it, it, it's, it's strange to me that after 60 years, we don't have people who can, you know, we don't have organic solution to our exploration uh, problem in Nigeria. GSM. We GSM have, uh, we what do you call it? We can't produce our own mm. GSM. Um, we have beauty men that has become a problem in Ondo, right. and we don't have the skill set that would, you know, refine this thing to tar roads. If we begin to locally generate skill set, imagine the and number of add, people that will be empowered. The iron, skill, the, the iron the engineers iron that we have here, we still go to so, get engineers from Germany. Exactly. So, when you see all of this, you see the value chain route. and you see the importance it, play, it plays. So there is a need for us to take education very seriously. All right. I think that um, it was Aristotle who said that uh, education is the ornament of prosperity and refuge in adversity. Um, that if you tie that to section 18, subsection 1 of the 1999 constitution as amended, the constitution frivolously made provisions for, on how the issue of education should be managed by the country. But what you see is that people come to tell you that that section is not justiciable. And, then, uh, and then the government, the governors of state, because education is actually on the concurrent list from uh, part two of the second schedule of the constitution. And then what you have is we have not been able to invest enough in education. And yet we are talking about development. And you cannot develop without education. Basic education. Yeah. Yeah. We have, you have, you, in the you, you have universal basic education that is a product of legislation. Right. Why the states are failing at that, the federal government is also failing at our own level. So what we have now is a system that have not been able to contribute positively to the development of the minds of the citizens of Nigeria. And you cannot have development without education. So by the time we have this kind of structure, you are going to continue to have problems. You have to spend more money to fight insurgency because I mean, if, it imagine, is the end result of lack of you know, education. And all imagine that. the entire budget of Nigeria is just the education budget of South Africa. Of course. <laughs> this, you know, to put things in perspective. Well, it tells you where our priority lies. Well, we really need to fix our educational system in this country. In a few seconds, I would address our Forex ban right after the break.
I once heard that diversification is an established tenant of conservative investment, and I speak on Forex ban for importation of foods and fertilizer, it's a season of endurance. In its quest to diversify the economy and boost the agri sector, the president directed the Central Bank of Nigeria to stop allocation of Forex for importation of food and fertilizer into the country. This policy, however, has elicited, elicited reactions from various quarters, including the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, who warned that the policy could cause further inflation as the country was not yet sufficient in food production. Nigeria is struggling to close a trade gap which widened to a record 1.8 trillion naira in the three months through June. This is after the global crash in the price of oil, the country's main export. This dropped 47% in the wake of Corona pandemic, which sapped the demand for the commodity. The, con con the continuous forex inflow dried up due to the oil price plunge, increasing pressure on dollar reserves and forcing the central bank to devalue the Naira twice this year. Nigerians were still grappling with the recent hike in electricity tariff and pump price of PMS, that's the premium motor spirit, which heralded an impending winter of discontent in the polity in light of the international effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. By preventing the impact of what some already consider phantom palliatives to sufficiently relieve the population, the administration is inadvertently inviting industrial unrest but tending great danger for an economy virtually reverting to recession. While I agree that certain necessary measures needed to be taken, like the subsidy removal, the timing couldn't have come at a worse time considering the hardship that Nigerians have had to endure throughout the pandemic. Government will have to be sensitive to the needs and welfare of its citizens and provide palliatives that will make impact and not 2,000 bosses for a population of over 200 million. <laughs> I like the finish. 2,000 bosses for 200 million people. In London alone, how many buses do you have on the, on, on the road? I, I, I think um, the, the, the uh, policy on foreign directed allocation to certain imports um, it, it, it's not, what was not a particularly well thought through policy. And that was why you, we saw policy somersault within a couple of weeks of the initial pronouncement. So the first pronouncement was, okay, don't give uh, FX to people to buy one of the products was maize. I remember maize. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of weeks after, we said, okay, you can give five, some five foreign people. exchange, but it will be to four importers who will import on behalf of the other because they have the capacity. The problem I see right there is that we make policy pronouncement without first thinking through the import of those policies. And then after we roll out the policy, the, the, the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria and the dealers went to make it, it, cases with uh, some, some people and, and the president. And then we reversed that policy. Why didn't we think through before we rolled out the policy? And it is the same with the whole lot of what we are doing as a country in terms, in terms of policy. We need, we need to harmonize our policy. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that... Um, we are not very proactive in our approach to investment and then um, national income and all the ancillary issues around it. I, I have lived for four decades in this country. I have never known anything about good governance, whether it is in the financial sector or in the economy or in any other direction. I think that uh, on this issue, the government will need to do more. The CBN should understudy the structure and idiosyncrasy of financial management and how we respond to it. There's a report they released some time ago that uh, Nigerians, most Nigerians have less than 500,000 around their accounts and all that. Oh. And then when you look at export, import, forest management, and the fact that we are not even a producing nation, the conflicts are much. 
what exactly can we put together to cushion the effects through policy of the sufferings of Nigerians and how can we use our financial expertise to uh, make sure that people are able to get the dividend of democracy, plan financially well, and then execute projects and have a worthwhile experience in this country. Uh, I like what you just said about a study saying that many Nigerians have just about 5,000 Naira in their mm -hmm. accounts. Of course, and that's why I think it's perpetuating poverty when you then do trader money and say you're giving um, traders 10,000 Naira to boost their trade. Like, <laughs> are you for real? I, do you even know the realities of what obtains in the markets? What can you buy with 10,000 Naira? How do we, what kind of injection is that into anybody's business? And this idea of policy up today, policy down tomorrow, we're going back and forth, two steps forward, several steps backward. It's not taking us anywhere. Yeah, but, but really, uh, um, Sedu, I want to ask um, some critical questions. Uh. Please. The border closure, mm -hmm. has it improved our local production of rice, mm. of rice. Uh, it rice, or it has even increased the price of it, the locally produced one because, like demand, forces of demand and supply, it is even not enough. And what are we doing to ensure that when we, like you once asked on this platform, mm -hmm. to ensure that once we finally open the border, yes. all of those reasons why we closed the border Nothing. would have been taken care of. Nothing. <laughs> and so sometimes I don't just want to complain. I want to still find those areas I can say, oh, the government is doing so well. But you look at how do you introduce a policy? Midway, you now realize, oh, no, we need to modify it. I had expected that you sit down, you think the policy through, you know, like even before you, like manufacturers, um, um, website builders, they look for hackers. And say, look, hack into this my, my website so that I'll be able to create firewalls. I will be able to know, you know, the vulnerability. That's right. We won't do it. Somebody manufactures a car, he gets drivers that will drive them roughly. So he knows the balance. Yeah. We won't do it. Pressure. It is when we, after we have introduced that policy, maybe Sedu is um, Sedu's friend. He's the president tomorrow. I just go to him and say, ah, you know, we can do this, do this. He said, hey, let, let's go ahead. Mm. He calls the chief of staff. And then it is after the introduction, you now see all the uh, stakeholders will be complaining. I say, oh, no, 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 let's go back. Right. I, I, I think we should, be, for me, the responsibility is on all of us. If we create excuses for ineptitude, we're going to consistently have, you know, this kind of policy somersaults. You know, I wanted to write something that will celebrate Nigeria on this uh, particular edition. I found it so hard because if I look this way, <laughs> there are issues. <laughs> you right about railway. Ah, uh, railway. Uh, that's Did what you... they are celebrating now. So mm. maybe. When there was a collision this week with uh, oh, a train and a car. I think, I think that there, there are successes. There. It's there, there are successes it's in those there. areas. Well, in, in Abuja, yeah. I like that one that takes you from the airport to Kaduna. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's Except that the trains are also locomotive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to start there from somewhere. <laughs> and then recently, Amrobas attacked some. Uh, and, so. yes. and a helicopter have to escort some too. So <laughs> we'll get there. At least so they were escorted <laughs> the helicopter. We're doing well. We're doing well. Like, like we say, oin. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you sharing your opinion with us. Omolayo Oshodi is angered by Liberal's last advocacy, old news as he says. You have spoken. The people who claim to be governing us are our problem in this country. Most of them are not knowledgeable enough to know what governance entails and what governance is all about. All they think about is to loot any available funds in the treasury. My dear Nasuwi Siamu, whereas Otumba Olami Lekon Samuel also says, Lai Lai government, this is the worst government in the history of our nation. Hmm. Also, Silv V says, great job on all our advocacies. Thank you, Omalayo Oshodi. Otumba Olami Lekon Samuel and Silv V, we appreciate your participation with us on our conversations. Continue to advocate with us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG.
To catch up with previous broadcast, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the, the advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, Evans goes down on our religious doctrines. In this edition of The Advocate, I want to explore a very sensitive terrain, more like a soul searching, if you like. I did ask Rabbi many moons ago, why do people fight for God? And that brings me to my topic, doctrinal conflict, fighting for God and owning him. Protangoras once said, man is the measure of all things. I feel this expression best sets the tune for this discourse. Man amongst all of God's creatures is presumed to be gifted with high levels of intelligence. So he yearns to connect to his maker, God, with the aforementioned biospiritual component to assuage his fears, renew his thoughts, fellowship with the supersensible, and address his material needs. In a bid to find favor with God through diverse religious platforms, people, and Nigerians in particular from all social strata, have developed doctrinal belief systems, some inspired by their religious rites and others by their revered clergymen or women for whom they tacitly rely on for spiritual knowledge and growth. This is not bad, if you ask me. What is bad here, therefore, is that no sooner had a Nigerian settled for a religion, indigenous or imported or traditional, than he began to see others as wrongful, wasteful, subhuman, baseless, and worthless. You hear him call others unbelievers and infidels with venomic intolerance. At this stage, his nuisance value is contained since, well, his temperamental disorder as distorted by religious intolerance has not broken into physical violence or combative hostilities just yet. But the seed of his conviction soon grows into a full fanatical monster to the point where he assumed he is choosing of God to exterminate unbelievers or infidels, if you like. He quickly searches his religious books for verses that justify his actions. Then he begins to fight for God by killing his fellow men, having found some unguarded theological lines, which were believed to have been written by some prophets addressing all uh, together a different society or environment at a time in human history, in ancient time, at a time when there were no laws and the sum total of human experience were conquest induced such that people kill to conquer territories. Some religious disorderly minded entities in 2020 reach that and take up arms to kill and destroy others rather than rely on their intuitive resonance and inner faculties with tranquilities to find God for them severe, thoughtful engagement and meditations on the supersensible. They barrage one another with their purported superior doctrinal idiosyncrasy. Isn't it ironic that you went to search for God but only came back dangerous and damaged? It is like taking a poisonous leaf to a purification feast. We fight for God and convict people for blasphemy, excommunicate them, suspend, and sometimes stone them to death, like the Pharisees did according to the laws of Moses in ancient Israel, where the canons were unjust and unreasonable. We label people stupid just on the basis of their faith. We smear and discriminate in Nigeria on the grounds of religion 
as if we are not beaten enough by tribalism. Now, hear this. There are places you can't find a job in Nigeria, not because you are not qualified or that there are no vacancies, but because your surname does not sound like it. We unwittingly set these standards, yet we talk about one Nigeria, but our dispositions are rooted in division on the basis of religious belief. We do not understand. Too bad. In all this, God has never and will never command anyone to kill or fight for him across religious lines the world over. Check through your religious books and change your approach. I would therefore advocate that we embrace love as this is the greatest commandment of all times. You cannot claim to love God and hate anyone. You are wrong. Vengeance is the Lord's, not yours. I shall go to Rabbi again. Hmm. Uh, I just want to add quickly that if, if religion was a currency, Africa should have been the wealthiest nation on earth. In the world. <laughs> Spot on. Absolutely. So Spot true. On. Spot on. So we, true. we are so religious and yet so backwards. The people that brought this religion to us suddenly are doing a lot better than us. They don't practice the religion the mm -hmm. way we have yes. so imbibed it. And it, this is not unconnected with the level of poverty. When there's absence of good leadership, these are the kind of things that you see. You know, people have to believe in something. They, they yes. look for something to hang on to. Yeah. And that is what we're seeing. And it's so sad because uh, earlier on, I was sharing with you that you know, now we're seeing uh, industries being replaced with worship centers. And the alarm the bells are not replaced with industry. industries, yeah. rather. You know, and they should send alarm bells. Yeah. There's a big problem. We need to really ask ourselves deep questions. But this is not unconnected with bad leadership, lack of education, and all of the things we've been advocating today. I mean, these are false lines. Ethnicity, tribalism, uh, or rather tribalism and religion in Nigeria. Those are false lines. So what our politicians do is to buy into that to further divide us. And we're not even smarter. We're looking at, okay, this is your religion, this is my religion. I'm not supposed to relate with you because, I mean, we're not supposed to be friends. Uh, if I can't win you over, then you're not my friend. Win me over for what? To what? Why don't we, just as Evan said, practice love? Because love conquers all. If you have love for somebody, you will not stay along Lagos about the express and be kidnapping people, for instance. You will not say, no, this is education, this is Western foul. education. It's going far. You won't use your car to block the road yes. because you are going to worship your God while I am traveling for other assignments. You know, because the most annoying part of it is that you are traveling on one of those, either first Friday or last Friday, and then some people who went to worship their God are depriving others who are going to worship their own God or do some other things from going to where they are going because, oh, you have to, you went for whatever they call it. And it's the two religions I'm, now, I'm, along I'm, I'm Lagos telling you, the I'm, I'm telling you all, all the fact that I tell some people in my church, look, you're going to church, you are blocked somebody's road, you block somebody's gates because you are running to go and serve God. Forgetting that you are inconveniencing somebody, you put your loudspeaker outside, you're disturbing others yes. because you are serving God. A woman once blocked my, my on New Year's Eve, blocked my window, then I used to live in Shogunle, and they brought some band, and they were singing praises. And I told the woman, I said, look, you are disturbing me. He said, I shouldn't allow the devil to use me. Yes, he said, you are fighting God. <laughs> I'm fighting God. That is you know? the point. Any little thing, God, God, like, as if... Yeah. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte once said I think Ekbalaho is uh, trying to... There, there is a case of a 13-year-old uh, that has been sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for blasphemy. Yes. And that is on the altar of a religious based law. Yeah. And I'm asking myself, I have a 13 year old too. What can I really hold a 13 year old responsible for? Yeah. And should I have to destroy him because I'm fighting on behalf of God or on behalf of one of his prophets? Mm. 
Um, it, it, it should send a message to our hearts as we do this, our religious stuff. In, in China, where they don't even do God matters, um, they live up to 77 years. 77 years is the life expectancy <laughs> in China. In Nigeria, it is 54. We need to start thinking right so that we are not fighting God's fight. God did not ask us to go and fight for it on his behalf. He can fight his own battle. That, that, that's my take on this topic. Well, uh, well, how you have said it, uh, if the truth of religious doctrines is dependent on an inner experience that bears witnesses to the truth, what is one to make of the many people who do not have that experience? I'm up next after the break. Dr. Nandi Azikiwe once said, when two incompatibles meet, they can coexist if only they agree to agree and agree to disagree. But Nigeria, can we ever agree? My learned senior mentor, G.T. Ogunye, senior advocate of the masses, recently said, a country does not survive solely because of false unity. It survives on purpose and fruitfulness. This Nigerian house, he said, is falling. Today, if it is not agitation for Odua Republic, it is movement for the actualization of Biafra, or Arewa threatening to send Igbos packing from the north. How about Boko Haram, Fulani headsmen, or a theft and militancy, or the once upon a time OPC? Why is the previous government granted amnesty to militants who didn't ask them for it? The current government sees Biafran agitators as miscreants that must be crushed while rehabilitating repentant members of Boko Haram. Yet the victims are still crying daily for succor from the same government. If this is not injustice from a motherland, then I wonder how else you would define it. Yet, we mouth the unity of Nigeria is not negotiable. I laugh in vernacular. Some stakeholders have canvassed for fiscal federalism or returned to the 1963 Republican Constitution, while others have argued that we either restructure discuss our coexistence through a referendum or go our separate ways. And like my brother and friend, Barista Tio Mwibu, once asked, are we really afraid of going our separate ways if that will guarantee justice, fairness, equity, peace, and security? I leave you to be the judge of that, though. Why countries like Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and USSR have all separated to foster equality, justice, security, and ethnic nationalism? We are here preaching unity in Nigeria, yet we have no solution to the genocide in South Kaduna, the illegal but officially condoned arms in the hands of killer headsmen, kidnappers, bandits roaming the country, the technically defeated Boko Haram, the amnesty militant or the kidnappers. How about the corruption, nepotism, ineptitude, and bare selfishness and planlessness on the part of the political class, president, governor, lawmakers, and their likes? Make we sit down there they deceive ourselves. Czechoslovakia, which had a population of 16 million people, less than the Lagos population, separated into Czech and the Slovakia on the 1st of January 1993. Yugoslavia in 1991 was 23.2 million, barely more than Lagos population. It broke into six countries same year, all along ethnic lines, namely Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia. Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Slovenia. In Europe, the UK permitted regional autonomy to the Irish, the Scots, and the Welsh, while the English dominated Westminster. Switzerland has four ethnic groups. Each of them rotates the presidency annually through seven cartons that constitute the Federation unit. These countries, like every other, might have their poor problems, but they are stronger and fostering, fostering independent today. I will therefore advocate, as posited by Professor Wale Shoinka and Professor George Obiozo and a lot of other scholars, apart from those in government. Nigeria, as presently constituted, is structurally flawed and badly configured. If not restructured, either along regional lines or allowed to discuss their cohabitation to either agree to agree or agree to disagree, it might give way forcefully without the opportunity of proper tailoring. The North, if properly harnessed, can not only feed the entire West Africa, but can become a new Dubai. The Southwest can enhance our creativity to become another Silicon Valley if they weren't waiting for revenue from a feeding bottle center. The Southeast, with accountable leadership and right infrastructure, 
can become the Japan of Africa, where the South-South can be able to look inward for possibilities that abound around them. Then we will indeed understand that united we fall, divided we stand. Um. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I love the compartmentalization of Nigeria. That the East can become the Japan of Africa because they have these fabrications and things they, they're technically smart. That the North can actually feed not only Nigeria but West Africa. There are tomatoes and onions and ginger and the rest of them. And then the Southwest or the West can be the Silicon Valley. We're smart, we're creative. You've touched on creativity, which is actually what we have. And then the East as well. But you remember on this program, I talked about this national conference not leading us anywhere. What will happen if we divide ourselves along these lines of strength? What is it that we find in Nigeria must be one, Nigeria must be one. Meanwhile, if you have a particular number for, 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 for secondary school entrance examination, you will not get admission in the West, but you'll get admission in the North because the, the, the points are lower. Same for university. So I can be as smart as can be in the West and I can't get into the university. And someone that has less than half of what I scored in JAM will get to the university in the North because of quota system. It's just not right. I think we can still, we can still do this uh, just right. by just devolving powers. Like if we go back to the 1963 constitution, That's we can have the country divided into the regional. six regions. Like we and had then we can now have different constitutions at those levels that is peculiar to the need uh, of those regions. And from there, the resources in those regions, we can now make legislations at the respective region to boost our creativity and our strength. The North, they are very good in agriculture and so many other net, uh, mineral resources that's in the North, and the huge deposit of uh, gold right. and uh, all that in the North. Then in the, in the Southwest, you have a lot of Isn't resources gold too. Right? You understand? So if we're able to, even with one country, but with a proper structured federal system of government, we can establish good uh, contact with the component unit, weaken the center, and then this component unit will generate positively right. to build a great uh, country. I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like very easy to, to say prefer some center, of those things we're know. talking about. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the practicability of it yes. is where the challenge is. Don't forget that, yes, the aberration, the military aberration is what got us to where we are yes. today. We would have learned, would have evolved because we had our regional yeah. system and yes. they had their own peculiar yeah, problems as well. Yeah. However, there are examples that we can learn from. I always use Rwanda. You know, when there's no love, mm -hmm. when there's a disconnect between the, the citizens and the, their, the leaders. their leaders, yes. there's definitely, because as an average Since Nigerian, you understand, you don't, feel, you don't feel that connect with the country. No pipe bond water, you can hardly afford to own a home, no, sense no of education, belonging. health, all the necessary things that would associate you to that country that would make you proud to hold a flag is missing. We need to reconnect with our people. We need to let them feel that there is a contract between them, you understand, and the leader. And yeah. then we'll begin to talk about, because honestly, all this fracturing we're talking about is not going to take us anywhere. Bolaho wants to reconnect. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, I believe Nigeria can be won. Absolutely. But the pre-1966 situation is what we need to look at. I cannot believe that a canoe that was doing leather trade in millions of dollars with yeah. Europe yeah. 100 years ago. Yes. Today goes to Abuja to go and beg for oil money from the South. Mm. How many states are feeding Nigeria? Maybe about four oil states and a few other states with taxes. Then the rest are there. Every month they go to Abuja to go and collect stipend. We are killing this station, nation every day that we remain as we are. The nation is grossly suboptimal because the states are not doing anything other than distributing wealth that they do not want. We need to restructure this. 
we need to restructure the country that you said. And truly, that has been the argument. The end always seems to come too soon on the advocates. However, even when we leave the studio, the advocates continues on our social media platform, on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, simply go to plustv.com forward slash the advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station, let's keep advocating for a better society. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, really it does, it does. It does. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.